thank you to the ISI for the invitation to speak, as well as to everyone who has taken the time to tune in. Now, as the title of this lecture indicates, the perspective from which I want to discuss the issue of citizenship stripping is through the lens of international criminal law. And given the myriad causes of statelessness, this is not a proposal that every instance of citizenship stripping could engage criminal responsibility. States, of course, have a measure of discretion to deny or deprive citizenship, and human rights violations only fall within the ambit of international criminal law when strict requirements are met. International criminal law, moreover, is not a panacea for this extremely complicated issue. That said, my focus is on one particular aspect of citizenship stripping, namely situations where a minority group is arbitrarily deprived of its nationality, resulting in the statelessness of its members, which I will refer to as denationalization induced statelessness in this lecture. Now this type of state action has been used as a tool to target groups in order to marginalize and oppress. The human rights implications for those affected are profound. And such targeted discrimination creates a permissive atmosphere of dehumanization that can threaten a group's existence and has in the past been the precursor to mass atrocity crimes. This is not an attempt to expand the remit of international criminal law, but to apply the existing law to the facts where warranted. The absence of any discussion of accountability in situations of denationalization and due statelessness results in a uniquely aberrant situation of state-sanctioned discriminatory mistreatment that causes serious violations of human rights, but does not carry even the threat of the individuals most responsible being held accountable. In this lecture, I want to build the argument for international criminalization through several steps. First, to look at the legal status of deprivation of nationality, specifically to show that arbitrary deprivation of nationality resulting in statelessness is prohibited under general international law, and that there is thereby a basis for criminalization. Second, reviewing the types of harm suffered due to the condition of statelessness, to demonstrate that the gravity of such harm warrants the invocation of international criminal law. Third, to highlight the link between denationalization induced statelessness and the commission of international crimes, which is not a prerequisite for criminalization, but reinforces the argument that it is necessary. Fourth, to review the historical precedent for criminalization, to show that the current proposal has an existing legal foundation in international criminal law. And lastly, to look at some of the international crimes that denationalization induced statelessness could constitute. So turning first to the applicable general international law. Though states have a discretionary power to decide who its nationals are, this is not absolute and it must comply with human rights obligations. The right of every individual not to be arbitrarily deprived of nationality, particularly on the basis of race, national origin, ethnicity or religion, is guaranteed under international law. This has been something of an evolution over time. Nationality has developed from an aspect of pure sovereign authority to a fundamental human right. The shift occurred predominantly in the latter half of the 20th century, specifically in response to the millions of displaced persons created by World War II. A key turning point was Article 15 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which set down not only that everyone has the right to a nationality, but that no one should be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality. And this was of course, followed by two specialized treaties on statelessness, the 1954 Convention on the Status of Stateless Persons, which was limited to defining stateless persons and trying to secure them the widest possible exercise of fundamental rights, and the 1961 Convention on the Reduction of Statelessness, which for the first time imposed positive obligations on states' parties to grant nationality in situations where the person would otherwise be stateless. Now, significantly, the 1961 Convention allows deprivation of nationality resulting in statelessness under limited circumstances. 
However, it expressly forbids states parties from depriving any person or group of their nationality on racial, ethnic, religious, or political grounds. Now, preventing members of a group from obtaining or retaining their nationality on discriminatory grounds is not only an arbitrary deprivation of nationality, but a breach of the well-established international law principle of non-discrimination. This is seen, for example, in Article 5 of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which requires state parties to guarantee, without distinction as to race, national origin, or ethnicity, the right of nationality. These and other legal instruments, both regionally and internationally, and pronouncements, demonstrate that arbitrary deprivation of nationality resulting in statelessness is impermissible under general international law, thus providing a foundational legal basis for international criminalization. So in terms of the human consequences of the condition of statelessness, because citizenship is a practical prerequisite for accessing judicial and political processes, and for obtaining economic, social, and cultural rights, being stateless often robs the individual of the means by which to access their fundamental rights and freedoms. The daily existence of those affected by statelessness involves interwoven discrimination affecting all facets of life. Stateless persons can face ongoing violations of the rights to liberty, to health, education, freedom of movement, family life, work, housing and access to justice amongst others. The impact of statelessness is felt particularly severely by women and children who are at a higher risk of kidnapping, of sexual exploitation, human trafficking and forced recruitment into armed forces. Now on top of the harm suffered by the individual, the effects of statelessness on minority groups are considerable. Once deprived of citizenship, groups are often denied protection of their minority rights. And examples include the right to protection of the group's cultural identity, such as recognition and use of minority languages or the freedom to practice minority religions. Moreover, the impact of statelessness on issues such as ownership rights, employment, or access to services means that states can effectively deprive minorities of access to wealth and resources. And this often results in impoverished, uneducated and disempowered groups that are vulnerable to further discrimination. Not only does this situation affect the immediate term, but where perpetuated, the precarious position and living conditions of those victimized are greatly exacerbated by intergenerational statelessness. But for such reasons, the UN Secretary General has noted that statelessness has a determinative impact on the protection of a minority's survival and existence within a territory. So given the extent of the various deprivations that individuals and the groups to which they belong may suffer, the gravity of the harm experienced by those targeted by denationalization induced statelessness clearly calls for international legal scrutiny. And the need for such an examination is heightened by how denationalization induced statelessness has been used by states as a policy to discriminate against minorities. History shows us that states have taken deliberate action to exclude populations from integrating into their citizenries through distinctions in the application of nationality laws. Denationalization induced statelessness thus offers a means of targeting a group and depriving them of their rights under the veil of the sovereign act of legislating for citizenship. Groups are typically targeted because they are not considered to belong to the society due to their minority status, because they are viewed as extensions of other powers, such as where there is a neighboring state with a similar ethnic composition, or because their ancestors may have migrated to the territory in the recent past. States may also denationalize minority groups for political advantage, Exclusion of part of a population can create social and political tensions that provide an opportunity to exploit division by those in power. Deliberately induced exclusion, 
when accompanied by an exacerbation of divisions between groups in society, provides fertile grounds for intolerance. This creates a permissive atmosphere of mistreatment of the targeted group, which as events have shown, has allowed and even facilitated the perpetration of serious crimes. The situation of the Jewish population in Germany and German occupied territories during World War II demonstrates that arbitrary deprivation of nationality can be the precursor to the commission of atrocities against those isolated and dehumanized by the condition of statelessness. Additionally, it provides us with an historical precedent for criminalizing denationalization induced statelessness. Now, the International Military Tribunal, which is also referred to as the Nuremberg Tribunal, put 24 major political and military leaders of Nazi Germany on trial. Its 1946 judgment described how the Reich citizenship law, which was one of the infamous Nuremberg laws of September 1935, and deprived, Germans of German, deprived Jews of German citizenship, resulted in the Jewish population being rendered powerless and their influence on the affairs of Germany being extinguished. The Nuremberg, heard, Nuremberg Tribunal heard evidence that the deprivation of citizenship of the Jews was an underlying element of the crimes that were subsequently committed against them. To give some pre brief examples, a telegram from the German ambassador in France to Nazi authorities in October 1940, proposed the collective deprivation of nationality of Jewish Austrians and Jewish Germans in France as the first step towards solving what was described as the Jewish problem. And a March 1942 memorandum entitled Deportation from France of 5,000 Jews stated that Jews of French nationality must be deprived of their nationality before being deported or at the latest on the day of the deportation itself. Hannah Arendt would later write that the Jews had to lose their nationality before they could be exterminated. Because in her words, one could do as one pleased with the stateless. Notably, the lawyer for Hermann Goring, who was the highest ranking Nazi official on trial, claimed that the passage of racial purity laws and decrees to exclude Jews were domestic matters dealing with the regulation of the legal status of German subjects. He argued that international legal opinion recognized that the German Reich was a sovereign state and was free to settle such a matter. He further claimed, and I quote, even if these encroachments were harsh and the limitations of citizenship rights extremely severe, they nevertheless in no way represent an offense against humanity. Ultimately, however, the Nuremberg Tribunal dismissed such arguments and held that discriminatory laws restricting rights of citizen citizenship amounted to the crime against humanity of persecution. Among those convicted was Wilhelm Frick, who had been the Reich's interior minister. The tribunal noted that Frick had drafted, signed and administered laws, including those depriving Jews of the rights of citizenship. The tribunal described these as crimes camouflaged in the form of legislation that were designed to eliminate Jews from German life and that had, and again I quote, paved the way for the final solution. This and other trials held after World War II are part of the foundations of what we consider to be modern international criminal law. And as such, these cases represent highly relevant precedent for individual punishment of those responsible for denationalization induced statelessness. So having touched upon the foundational legal basis for criminalizing denationalization induced statelessness, the need for criminalization due to the seriousness of the, of the harm suffered and the link to the commission of atrocities, as well as outlining the historical legal support for criminalization, I now want to come to the substantive international crimes that could be applicable to situations of denationalization induced statelessness. At this point, I will focus on the crimes against, on crimes against humanity and genocide, using the statute of the International Criminal Court as a reference. So at the outset of any discussion of crimes against humanity, we must first look at what are called the chapeau or contextual elements. 
These must be met before an assessment can be made of whether conduct constitutes one of the crimes that are characterized as crimes against humanity. And when I speak about conduct or impugned acts, I am referring to the implementation or perpetuation of denationalized Asian and Jew statelessness. According to the jurisprudence of the ICC, the contextual elements of crimes against humanity require that the impugned act is committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against a civilian population pursuant to a state or organizational policy and is perpetrated with knowledge that the act is part of the attack. Assessing these requirements in terms of denationalization and due statelessness, it is important to note that an attack for the purposes of crimes against humanity does not have to be a military attack or involve violence. It could therefore encapsulate the implementation or continuation of discriminatory legislation targeting a minority group. That the attack must be widespread or systematic is meant to exclude isolated events. The term widespread signifies a large scale and a multiplicity of victims. The term systematic relates to the organized nature of the impugned acts and the improbability of their random occurrence. Now, given that denationalization induced statelessness, as discussed here, involves state machinery to target and make stateless part of a population, it is possible that such action could meet both the widespread and systematic criteria, depending on the circumstances. Additionally, such state action, or indeed inaction, as in the situation where a government or regime perpetuates a discriminatory deprivation of nationality, fits within the concept of a policy for the purposes of crimes against humanity, which requires that an, an attack was planned, directed, or organized. Likewise, because it is state-sanctioned denial of nationality, the knowledge requirement that connects the perpetrator's acts, for example, the head of a government or regime implementing such legislation, and the overall attack itself would likely be met in practice. Having addressed the contextual elements, the substantive crimes against humanity I would like to briefly discuss are apartheid, persecution, and other inhumane acts. The ICC's statute defines apartheid as encompassing inhumane acts that are committed in the context of an institutionalized regime of systematic oppression by one racial group over any other racial group and committed with the intention of maintaining that regime. And because inhumane acts within that definition are not defined in the ICC statute, we may look to the Apartheid Convention of 1973 for interpretative guidance. That convention lists nine basic rights and freedoms, which if denied may amount to the crime of apartheid. And this includes the right to a nationality. Apartheid is, of course, synonymous with the racist regime that held power for decades in South Africa. In 1984, John Dugard described how denationalization of black South Africans was used in pursuance of apartheid. This, he argued, occurred primarily through the Bantu Homeland Citizenship Act, which decreed that every black person of South African nationality became a citizen of one of the 10 ethnic homelands then part of South Africa. These ethnic units were then to be granted independence and the citizens of each unit would lose their South African nationality. Thereafter, when South Africa discriminated against the new aliens by refusing them full civil and political rights, it would do so under the veil of the law as it was no longer discriminating against its own nationals. Through this legal maneuver, Black South Africans deported to their national states were unable to participate in South African society. And the UN General Assembly described this policy at the time as designed to deprive the African majority of citizenship and to further dispossess it of its fundamental rights, labeling it as an international crime. It is the cumulative effect of violations of international human rights law were operating to control, dominate, and suppress those targeted that amounts to a form of systematic domination within the meaning of the crime of apartheid. 
And going back to the apartheid convention, the deprivation of the rights to work, education, to leave and to return to a country, as well as to freedom of movement and residence are considered acts of apartheid. The violation of these rights, as mentioned earlier, often result from the condition of statelessness. And denationalization induced statelessness effectively institutionalizes discrimination and fundamental human rights violations to the cost of the targeted group. It could therefore amount to the crime of apartheid. Moving to the crime of persecution, which prohibits severe deprivation of the fundamental rights of an identifiable group on discriminatory grounds. While the content of the term fundamental rights is not defined in the relevant provision of the ICC statute, the rights at issue must be such that their deprivation are contrary to international law. As discussed at the outset, the right not to be deprived of nationality on discriminatory grounds is a fundamental right and its violation is considered contrary to international law. Importantly, acts of persecution do not have to themselves amount to a crime. Thus, discriminatory acts and policies of a state that may be authorized by its legal regime or perpetrated as a result of legislation are covered by the crime of persecution, as seen in the Nuremberg example discussed earlier. The group that is subject to discrimination may be identifiable by virtue of objective criteria or the subjective perception of the perpetrator, who must have targeted persons because of the identity of the group to which they belong. And this would include targeting on political, racial, ethnic, gender, cultural, religious, or other grounds that are universally recognized as impermissible. A decision to deprive a group of its nationality resulting in the statelessness of its members or perpetuating such deprivation is an inherently discriminatory act that results in gross human rights violations to those impacted and could therefore be characterized as the crime of persecution. Lastly, the crime of other inhumane acts covers conduct which intentionally causes great suffering or serious injury to mental or physical health. Other Inhumane Acts has been part of international criminal law since post-World War II cases and was designed as a residual crime to ensure that conduct that would not otherwise be classified as one of the listed crimes against humanity would not go unpunished. A pretrial chamber of the ICC has noted that this crime must be interpreted conservatively so as not to expand uncritically the scope of crimes against humanity. However, the sole determinant of whether conduct could be criminalized as an other inhumane act is whether it causes mental or physical pain which reaches the threshold of harm required. International practice has qualified a wide range of conduct as other inhumane acts, including enforced prostitution, deplorable conditions of detention for prisoners, severely injuring peaceful protesters and threatening them with execution, and sniping at civilians. As already laid out, the extent to which statelessness can pervasively impact on almost all facets of a person's life, as well as the anguish and uncertainty of, of effectively being excluded from society, sometimes for generations, can occasion severe mental and physical harm, and therefore could potentially be qualified as the crime of an other inhumane act. Turning briefly to the question of whether denationalization induced statelessness could amount to an act of genocide. The kernel element of the crime of genocide is the specific intent requirement, meaning that a genocidal act must be carried out with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a specific national, ethnic, racial or religious group. The ICC statute contains five enumerated genocidal acts denationalization induced statelessness could, depending on the circumstances, be characterized as two of those, namely causing serious bodily or mental harm to the members of the group or inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction. The ICC's elements of crimes 
notes that acts causing serious bodily or mental harm may include inhuman or degrading treatment. Now, in terms of the required scale of the harm suffered, jurisprudence from ad hoc international criminal tribunals indicates that it need not be permanent and irremediable, but must result in a grave and long-term disadvantage to a person's ability to lead a normal and constructive life. The various ramifications of statelessness already outlined lead to extreme vulnerability and debilitating effects throughout the course of a lifetime that could be characterized as causing serious mental or bodily harm to members of the group affected. Regarding the infliction on the group of conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, which is also sometimes referred to as the imposition of measures of slow death, the ICC's elements of crimes specify that this may include deliberate deprivation of resources that are indispensable for survival, such as food or medical services or systematic expulsion from homes. It is not required that the conditions lead directly to death so long as they were calculated to do so. And again, the myriad deprivations inherent in being made stateless, such as restrictions on access to health facilities livelihood and segregation from other communities often expose those affected to destitution, long-term health risks, expulsion and preventable deaths. The infliction of such circumstances as a matter of policy could therefore, depending on the purpose of creating or maintaining the group's condition of statelessness, be considered as imposing conditions of life on the group calculated to physically destroy it. The required intent to destroy a group in whole or in part means that a substantial part of the group is targeted for destruction and there must be a concrete threat to its existence. Viewed through the lens of denationalization and due statelessness, where this is employed as a discriminatory tool, it demonstrates an intent to target a particular group as a group and has the potential for the reasons already discussed to threaten the continued existence of that group and thereby potentially amounting to an act of genocide. So to wrap up, mass arbitrary deprivation of nationality resulting in statelessness occasions a multitude of human rights deprivations, crippling the prospects of individuals and resulting in the economic, social and cultural stagnation of entire communities. It creates an ongoing situation where, in the eyes of a law, that group is undeserving of the most basic rights and protections needed to function with dignity in society. Despite the remarkable impact caused, the perception of regulation of citizenship as a domestic matter shields state officials who would seek to use the law as a pretext to target minorities. Looking ahead, as Kaya mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, the potential that minority groups continue to be targeted in this way should be of heightened concern, given the rise of ethno-nationalist populism and leaders gaining power with the aid of xenophobic and nativist rhetoric. As both history and more recent events have shown, denationalization induced statelessness is a blueprint through which the marginalization and ostracization of a group is achieved and ultimately destruction of the group can be pursued. This should be a matter of concern for the international community as a whole, and those responsible for visiting such devastation upon vulnerable groups should be held individually criminally accountable. And on that note, I will thank you for your time and for your attention.